Uh, Blitzed has eminent German author Norman Oller uh, talking about his best-selling book with A.S. Paneer Selvan, the Hindu's readers, uh, uh, readers' editor. Please give them a round of applause. Good morning. It's my pleasure to have Mr. Norman Oller here. He's not a conventional non-fiction writer. He's a filmmaker and a creative writer who stumbled upon this idea to do this work on role of drugs in the Nazi Germany. And uh, it's an extremely interesting book because it talks about the relationship between military, political establishment and the pharma industry, the convergence of this strange relationship between synthetic drugs and uh, the way Nazi Germany used it to keep their morale high during the most difficult times. As a journalist, for me, the most striking aspect of this book is the meticulousness with which he collected the details. Almost every medicine which has been administered to even Hitler has been documented. And the way he managed to scout the archives to put this thing together is amazing. Let's hear from himself. Uh, welcome, Norman. Hello. Hello. Hi. Uh, first, tell us how did you decide to write this book? Where um, did you get this idea that there was a substantial drug abuse in the Nazi Germany? This is a pretty crazy story. Um, I know a friend who is a DJ in Berlin and um, he worked together, he, he has a friend who his job is to um, come to your apartment when you have old things that you don't need anymore. And he's, he, he's, he buys these old things and, there, and one day he was buying an old pharmacy chest from someone in an old East Berlin apartment and in this old pharmacy cabinet were still medications from the 1940s, from the Nazi times. And on one of the packages, it was uh, labeled pervitin, and the ingredient of this medicine was methamphetamine. And he told this to my friend who is a DJ, because methamphetamine is a very strong illegal drug. He said, look, this was once legal in Germany. And my friend, the DJ, who is very interested in those medicines, he actually tried one. And he said, after all these years, it still worked very strongly on him. And he told me this story, so I became interested in what was actually legally on the market back then in Germany. And that's, that was the beginning of my research. See, uh, when did you discover that the pharma industry in Germany had a edge over the others? Because uh, you had, uh, in your books, talked about the difference between uh, German pharma industry and the British industrial enterprise. And he said that since German never had a colony, they have to synthetically create all these things. Could he actually elaborate on that aspect? Well, I mean, Germany evolving as a modern um, performance-driven society in the center of Europe um, was also in need or was craving um, stimulants that other countries like Great Britain were able to uh, to import because they were exploiting uh, other com other countries uh, like uh, like India and with, with their colonial uh, enterprises. So Germany didn't have this to that extent. So um, what was happening in Germany was that um, company. In the beginning, it was pharmacies, pharmacies, pharmacists tried to develop um, their own uh, remedies and stimulants. And um, so th this, is, th this is, in a way, the beginning of the German pharmaceutical industry, which also became a very important part of the German economy as a whole. So um, a lot of these very dangerous drugs that we know today were once perfectly legal German products, for example, heroin, uh, was a product by the Bayer, the Bayer company, who also developed aspirin. In fact, the same chemist who developed aspirin, Hoffman was his name, 
he found uh, heroin uh, in the same week. So within a week, he came to his bosses with two new medicines that he had uh, developed, aspirin and heroin. Um, and um, in the beginning, the, the CEOs of Bayer were not sure at all which drug would be more uh, profitable to them. There was, uh, if, if you can actually Google ads on heroin, you, we will find all these ads that Bayer put out. And it was even uh, suggested that children should take heroin if they can't fall asleep. So we, we can see that a lot of these substances that we now know today as addictive, dangerous drugs were once regarded as, uh, as perfectly normal uh, substances, products, medicines. I don't know if that answers your question. See, one of the interesting things which comes through the book is the role of these medicines or these drugs during the 1940 and 41 Blitzkrieg. It was a conscious decision or did they stumble upon it or how did the military establishment decided to administer this particular medicine to the troops? Well, as, as we just kind of introduced um, the fact that drugs and medicines were very much an accepted part of German society. Um, there's one date in German history that changes that and that's January 30th, 1933 when the Nazi party takes power and the Nazi party um, immediately says that all these drugs that were so readily available before uh, are considered poisons and they should be removed from society because the Nazi movement tried to portray itself as a clean, um, a, a clean movement that, uh, that creates an ideology that's so strong that drugs are no longer needed. Um, the irony then is that the exact opposite happens um, because in the mid-30s, um, this methamphetamine that I spoke about is being developed by a, by a Berlin company. And it's not stigmatized as a drug. It's uh, le legally sold in, in, in pharmacies. A anyone can get methamphetamine as much as you like. And then there's one professor working for the German army. Um, before the war, he reads studies on methamphetamine which claim that um, people need less sleep if they take methamphetamine and they are less afraid in uh, dangerous situations when they take it. So he suggests this, uh, he suggests to, to you that this should be used uh, by the German army and so the German army actually becomes the first army in the world to use um, a very potent um, stimulant like methamphetamine on a, on a huge scale and in, in my book I examine what effects this has on the performance of the soldiers. See, uh, initially they exhibited this uh, lack of sleep for three or four days and they continued and... Uh, but what was the impact of the, those soldiers immediately after that? Is there any medical records of the health of the soldiers who undertook these medicines? Are you asking if there's neg negative side effects? Yeah, negative side effects. Yeah, there are negative side effects, obviously, because methamphetamine is an addictive drug. But the positive side effects were the one were the side effects that were first that were first noticed because it was actually the German strategy to attack France was basically impossible, and it was based on Hitler's conviction that the German soldier is has supernatural powers and can even overwhelm an, an enemy that has more manpower and better weapons, which was the fact because the German army had less people and the weapons were not as good as the weapons uh, of the British and French combined and they also had less people. So the, the plan to attack was uh, actually madness. And then the plan they uh, decided on was to go through a mountainous terrain in a very quick in a very short um, time span, within three days and three nights, they had to reach a certain point in France in order to cut off the Western Allies. And everyone in the high command said this is impossible because at night they have to rest and then they will take two, two, the, they will not be able to go through within three days and three nights because human beings cannot do this. They have to sleep at night. So this is when the methamphetamine uh, comes into play. They used uh, on 1.8 million soldiers uh, 35 million dosages of methamphetamine, which is quite a lot. 
And um, one of the main tank generals was, gave a, a compliment to his troops after the attack, saying that they actually stayed awake for 17 days and 17 nights on this methamphetamine. So these were the very positive, in terms of military, uh, from a military standpoint, positive side effects. And then the negative side effects later on when people died of heart attacks and such were also then being investigated and reported back to Berlin. But the military stated that these negative side effects are not as important as the overall uh, military benefit that the Germans received from the drug. When we are talking about the military benefits, this also the phase which actually showed that the local commander defied the central leadership. He decided to go ahead with the strike, which you have documented. Therefore, in that sense, how did the high command look at the defiance of the local commanders who decided to go ahead despite uh, the high command's decision? Well, it created a lot of friction within the army because um, the lower commanders, which were also high generals like Rommel, who became very famous later on, the so-called Desert Fox. He was one of the biggest fans of using methamphetamine and his, his division uh, used um, uh, a huge quantity of the drug and was therefore behaving in a way that Hitler didn't understand anymore. He tried to, uh, he tried to conduct um, how the troops were moving, but the troops were actually moving much faster than he could, he could imagine, which created this problem um, at Dunkirk, where Hitler said all the troops, sh all, all the troops should stop now. It was basically an attempt by him to get back in control of the, of the whole operations, which was obviously a big mistake because that allowed the British to leave through the channel back to uh, the island. See, one of the, the interesting uh, review of your book happened in uh, the British media. They said that actually alcohol had a much bigger impact than the drugs and they say that you have laid more emphasis on the drugs and they also find problem with you quoting that popular Berlin song which said not so very long ago sweet alcohol that beast brought warmth and sweetness to our lives but then the price increased and so cocaine and morphine Berliners now select let lightning flashes rage outside we snort and we injure and we inject. They say that this is actually overstating the case for drugs because the alcohol consumption did not go down. Well, alcohol has always been a drug of choice for um, soldiers and the British Army for a long time relied on alcohol, um, giving rum to their sailors, for example. Also, when Germany attacked France on May 10, 1940, the French immediately put their old uh, rule into place from the First World War to give every soldier three quarters of one liter of red wine per day. So uh, 3,500 tank uh, uh, trucks filled with red wine were moving from the French wine land to the, to the places where the French soldiers were. But you cannot compare the effect of alcohol to the effect of methamphetamine, which is much, much stronger. So, um, in a way, methamphetamine uh, replaced alcohol as the main drug of choice for soldiers. See, the person who emerges very interesting in your book is Dr. Morrill, uh, Hitler's personal physician and who calls Hitler as patient A. Uh, could you tell us more details about him? Because he is, appears in the scene from nowhere and suddenly becomes so important. What is his background and how did he emerge so powerful? Well, next to the story about how the German army abused drugs, the big story of the book is probably um, a new biography of Hitler, uh, examining much closer how Hitler lived and um, how he made it on a day-by-day day day basis and the key person that you need to examine to understand Hitler is actually Morel, the, the doctor that you mentioned. Uh, he was a celebrity doctor in Berlin in the early 30s, um, treating 
famous actors and um, sports people and princes and um, was known to uh, be a, the perfect doctor if you didn't have a serious disease, but if you wanted to feel better. And so he was a doctor feel good and he gave injections of uh, euphoric making um, uh, combinations of medicines. So that's what he was known for. He was a very expensive doctor and he was treating a friend of Hitler who was very happy with the injections he received from Morel. And so this friend arranged, uh, his, his name was Hoffmann, he was the photogra photographer of Hitler. He arranged a meeting between Hitler and Morel and Hitler complained of, this was in 1936 before the Olympic Games in Berlin, and Hitler complained of his stomach problems. He had had stomach problems um, for many years and none of his doctors could, uh, could cure uh, these mysterious uh, um, problems and Morel was able to cure them uh, with um, a strong injection, he was also he was giving opiates very liberally in his injection, uh, the, uh, an, opio an opioid, a half synthetic opiate called oicodal, which is today still on the market as oxycodone. It's very popular, for example, in the United States, where we have an opioid uh, epidemic. Uh, people are using this oxycodone because it makes you, it numbs all your pain and it makes you euphoric at the same time, and uh, Morel was already using this in the early 30s uh, in Berlin and was using this uh, with Hitler. And Hitler uh, enjoyed uh, these injections because they, in fact, are very powerful and mood-enhancing and psychoactive uh, injections. So um, after the first injection, he immediately appoints Morel to be his personal physician, which Morel's wife um, doesn't appreciate at all because she says from now on you will be with Hitler every day uh, for, for the rest of your career and this is exactly what happened because Hitler never let Morel away from his side even when Morel's brother died Hitler didn't want him what didn't want to let him go to the funeral because he said who will give me my injections if you are gone for a couple of days and what if something happens to you who will who will be at my side so a very strong and dependent relationship forms between the two men. And um, I investigate this in the book and try to uh, show how this uh, was also changing uh, decision making or was forming uh, the day to day life in the inner circle of the regime. See, one of the interesting element about, uh, elements about Theodore Morel is he was not only a doctor, but he was also an entrepreneur the way he managed to use his proximity to Hitler to get certain clearances, to establish his uh, procurement of uh, the materials, uh, the way he got uh, the ministries to clear his applications for various factories. There were the businessman Morel and the Dr. Morel, how do they come together and how does this proximity play a role in that? Well, it has a lot to do with Morel's wife because she was not only unhappy that her husband was now only with this uh, man called Hitler, but also she said, we have a ve very well-going practice in Berlin. And he made, Morel made a lot of money in Berlin, but when he became personal physician of Hitler, he had a monthly salary, which was not that high. And in addition to treating Hitler, he had to treat all the, other, all the generals around Hitler for free. That was, so it was basically the honor of having this job was, was not really paying off monet financially. So, uh, and Morel at the same time, he saw that everyone around Hitler was making a lot of money uh, because there was a, obviously a lot of corruption within the inner circles and the people knew, the high ranking people knew how to make money but Morel hadn't figured out yet how. Uh, and then while the attack on France was happening and everything was going very well for the Germans. He had a lot of time. He was sitting in the headquarters and he was thinking, how, how can I make money with this? And then he decided uh, that his position as the personal physician uh, could be used in order to force uh, Nazi or mass organizations to take products if he would develop these products. So the first product he developed was a mult, mult, multivitamin product called Vita Multin. Um, so he was actually the first person uh, in Europe or maybe in the world to create like a, a multivitamin um, tablet. 
Uh, at the time, vitamins were not, people didn't know that much about them, that they're so beneficial, but Morel pushed this and was able then to sell hundreds of millions of his product to uh, the German army, uh, German workers' organizations, and so forth. And from that uh, starting point, he created um, a kind of one-man pharmaceutical empire um, that in the end was producing um, lots of different um, medicines and, and very dubious medicines as well. Uh, for example, when Germany was occupying in 1942 and, and until 43, uh, the Ukraine, the country of Ukraine, which was part of the Soviet Union, um, Morel um, was able to uh, get the monopoly on all the um, uh, organs of all the slaughtered animals, of all the slaughterhouses in the Ukraine, all that, the organs had to be transported to his factory and then he created um, steroids like liver extracts and, and all kinds of very strange um, medicines that were thought to be good f stimulating for the human organism and then they were shipped to the German troops and um, uh, a kind of a weird thing about this is that at the time there were no more uh, regulations in place in Germany how to introduce new medicines to the market so basically these medicines could not be allowed to, onto the market but he found a way uh, to go around this uh, regulation and he just gave new medicines that he developed to Hitler Hitler tried them out and if Hitler liked them, uh, he wrote a letter saying that now they can be uh, given to the, to the whole population. So in a way, Hitler posed as a guinea pig for his personal physician. So new, uh, very strange medicines could be introduced to the market. So in the book, you're also documenting about the tension between the medical establishment, which is uh, not too happy with the medicines, what uh, Morel was prescribing and they also wanted to have some sort of a limiting of these supplies to the troops and as well as to the general public. How was that initiative by the medical establishment was subverted by Morel and Hitler? Can you say that again? I'm sorry. See, there was a reservation about supply of these uh, uh, crystal meth and uh, the medical establishment wanted to limit it. But despite their objection, Morel managed to overcome it and push it. How did that happen? Well, whenever someone didn't want to um, make anything possible for Morel's new medicines to come onto the market, he would just say, I'm going to go to Hitler and, and tell Hitler that you're not, that you're working against the the good of the German people, and then everyone would comply with uh, what he said. So he was very smart in using his position to, to get his way. What was the size of Morel's establishment? Well, he bought one of the biggest pharmaceutical companies in occupied uh, Czechoslovakia, which had been owned by, uh, which had been built up uh, by, uh, by Jewish people, that they were they were basically robbed of their property and um, this was called Aryanization of properties. This was going on all over in Germany and in, in the occupied territories. Uh, Jews were being robbed of their uh, properties so Morel could buy one, a, a very big factory for a very small price and he employed a chemist there and uh, was um, speaking on the phone with his chemist every night because he couldn't go to his own factory because he had to stay with Hitler all the time. So um, he was basically running his uh, pharmaceutical empire from his desk in the headquarters of uh, Hitler. See, for a doctor, uh, the basic idea is you should be in touch with the latest literature. You have to be abreast of what is happening. But Morel from 41, 42 onwards stayed in the various bunkers and he traveled from one bunker to another bunker with Hitler. Staying in the bunker, how did he manage to update himself or did he update himself or did he repeat himself? What was his scientific knowledge acquiring during this period? Well, the problem with the life in the bunker is that you don't really update at all. Uh, you stay in a bubble 
And this was also was hap what was happening to Hitler and was probably the biggest problem in a way for Hitler that he was, or not problem, it was just his, the, the way of life of this uh, inner circle to be in a complete bubble that was not in touch with reality, not even in touch with reality of what was going on in the battlefield. So when the generals were coming from the outside or from the front, coming into this bubble of the headquarters, telling Hitler the, about the real situation, um, they were basically meeting a person that was um, so convinced of his own ideology of a final victory of, of the Germans, and on the other hand so doped up on euphoric making stimulants uh, that it was impossible for them to penetrate that bubble. And Morel was also in a bubble, I mean he was not really knowledgeable about um, uh, developments in the, in, the me in the medical world that were going on outside. Um, he was trying to pr produce pen penicillin, for example, which was um, becoming a decisive factor in the war because the British had developed penicillin, uh, antibiotics, uh, which were very important to cure wounds, obviously. Germans didn't have that, and Morel always claimed that he can also produce it, but he was never really able to produce it, and Hitler believed until the end that Morel would be able to produce it. Also, Morel produced a powder against lice, uh, which he uh, sold in millions of packages to the German army. Lice were a big problem on the Eastern Front, in, in the Soviet Union especially, but this lice powder also was completely ineffective. So, um, what was happening in, in, the inner, in, in the headquarters was a continuation of a removal from reality, which led to more and more uh, problems because, in fact, they were acting within reality because they were fighting a very real war against very real enemies. See, one thing which comes out very strongly in your book is while drug kept the mindset of war going, the very idea of being so evil and nothing to do with drugs, it came with Hitler even before he started using the drugs. Uh, therefore, uh, in fact, you said that this book is not using drug as an excuse, but you trying to explain the role of the drugs in making the war much more messier than what it was. Yeah, it's a very important point to make to, or to understand that the atrocities of the racist regime that was once ruling over Germany are not these ideas are not coming from drug use, they are coming from uh, a racist, right-wing, nationalistic um, ideology that tries to, um, tries to separate minorities and tries to oppress minorities. So this is not connected with drugs, but this um, uh, despicable um, way of thinking and of acting, um, which does not really uh, integrate with, with the, or should not integrate with the, with the, global, uh, with the global community, um, was in the need of very strong stimulants in order to carry out uh, some, of, some of its um, uh, goals and, uh, yeah. See, you are talking about the essential hypocrisy of the Nazi Germany. It says that drugs are Jewish creation, but it became dependent on drugs. Uh, you talked about um, the teetotal uh, total Hitler who had to take all the animal products as injections. What is the meaning of this hypocrisy around that time? What was its political implication? Was it purely an internal aspect of the Nazi leadership? Or did it have a much larger political ramification? Well, I think, I mean, we have a big problem in the West, which is the so-called war on drugs, which is just a, a, a term for a phenomenon where um, the state is trying to design anti-drug laws or drug laws for its own benefit in order to control people and oppress minorities and single out certain minorities. Um, 
So this is very similar to uh, what the Nazis did when they took power. They said uh, drugs are Jewish and um, we will get rid of all the drugs just as, our, as we are getting rid of the Jews and we will create a pure, clean society. Um, so this is, this is the racist uh, part of their, of their drug policies and on the other hand they're using uh, all these drugs in order to enforce their own uh, political agenda, like giving it uh, to the soldiers in order to conquer other countries. So we, it's just a very shiny example of the hypocrisy of certain regimes uh, dealing uh, with the uh, phenomenon of drugs. See, uh, you had actually accessed uh, Dr. Morel's uh, notes uh, he was with Hitler for 885 days out of 1340 days during his bunker days. That is between August 1941 and April 1945. And uh, some of the critics, especially the British uh, media, said that the patient is uh, notes what Dr. Morel had kept. And you have interpreted that administering that medicine X as crystal meth. It might not have been crystal meth, it could have been anything else. How did you arrive at that the X meant crystal meth? Well, to, to decipher Morel's notes is not so easy. Um, but you don't even, I mean, uh, a lot of times it's very explicit talking about the opioids and uh, Sometimes um, he just writes X, so it's impossible actually to, to know what is X. Where did you access these notes? Did you get it from Germany or did you collect it from Washington? Because you have visited the archives in Germany as well as in the US. What are the material you got from Germany and what are the things you have to access from the US archives? Well, when, when, world, when the Second World War was over and Germany had, uh, had lost, um, and Hitler was dead, Morel was still alive, he was hiding in a small village in Bavaria uh, where American forces arrested him and interrogated him for two years and took all of his uh, possessions and uh, notes and uh, brought them all to Washington because Americans were very interested in finding out whether Hitler was using drugs, whether Morel was poisoning Hitler or what was actually going on in the headquarters. So they, uh, there's lots of intelligence reports on Morel to be found in the National Archives of the United States. Um, but uh, in the uh, 50s and 60s, most of these findings were giving back, given back to Germany. So you can actually find Morel's notes in the Federal Archives of Germany, most of it. Some of it, the Americans forgot to give back, so it was actually good to go to Washington and see those last bits, but um, most of it is in Germany by now. How did people like Himmler and others looked at Dr. Morel and what was their reaction to Dr. Morel and his way of treating patient A? Well, it was a big controversy within the inner circles. Um, everyone was very suspicious of Morel. Everyone wanted to know what Morel was giving Hitler because people could see that, for example, Hitler was extremely depressed and feeling low and then Morel would enter Hitler's room and 20 minutes later, Hitler would come out completely euphoric, totally convinced that Germany would obviously win the war and had to stay on track and everything was going well. So there was lots of rumors what was going on between the two men and they would never disclose it. Morel never said what he gave Hitler. He just wrote it in his notes, but at the time no one could read these notes. And uh, Hitler, when was was asked, he said um, between doctor and patient, there's um, uh, uh, Geheimnis, we say in Germany, it's a, it's a secret between patient and doctor, no one else is allowed to know what's going on, so, and Hitler said this also applies to me, so there's, they, they never spoke about it. So for example, Himmler became uh, very suspicious about Morel and tried to, uh, tried to monitor him. The same is with Martin Bormann, the secretary of Hitler uh, was very suspicious. In fact, the, they tried to remove Morel at a certain point in time, but Hitler didn't allow that because Hitler needed Morel on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but there's also others like Goebbels, the Minister of Propaganda, 
uh, he liked Morel very much and also became a patient of him and, and received morphine from him. So I suppose if you were into uh, morphine-based drugs, uh, you would go to Morel and become uh, his patient, while if you were completely against this sort of uh, thing like Himmler, uh, who was against drugs, he actually uh, did, he was one of the few people in the, higher, in the highest ranks who was clean in a way, uh, then you became very suspicious of Morel. Also Speer, the architect, was a patient of Morel. Uh, there was a time when it became um, important for your career to also become a patient of Morel and receive the same drugs as Hitler. See, one of the interesting things happens in the last uh, days of Hitler, when the drug supply got stopped and Morel is not able to access the drugs, and finally Hitler gets angry with Morel and he sacks them. Could you recollect these last few days, there are tumultuous relationship between Morel and Hitler when the relationship started going down before Hitler could actually sack him? Well, the, um, the British were bombing Germany very heavily uh, in the last uh, months uh, or years uh, of the war and uh, in 1944 they included pharmaceutical companies in a bombing campaign and um, the Merck company who was producing the Oikodal, which was Hitler's favorite drug that he needed on, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis um, starting in 1944, was destroyed in December 1944. And uh, Morel complains in his notes that um, Oikodal, uh, or has, that has no longer has Oikodal available. Uh, and uh, they are sitting in the bunker in Berlin in those last months of the war in 1945. And Morel employs two helpers who drive with motorcycles through bombed out Berlin, going from pharmacy to pharmacy, trying to find um, the uh, narcotics that Hitler was used to, and they cannot find, find them anymore. Um, so Hitler st starts suffering from heavy drug withdrawal, basically, and uh, his health deteriorates uh, very rapidly in, uh, in the bunker because of that. The last he question. becomes very unhappy with his doctor because the doctor introduced him to very strong medicines and suddenly he's not able to supply them anymore. See, the last question before I open it for the audience to ask some questions. From 1944, the way you describe Hitler, he has become a wreck. His physical condition was completely shaken. And this description of Hitler... Uh, how did the party look at it and how did the party come to terms with this falling Hitler's health? Well, it was a huge problem. I mean, no one knew or no one discussed, except from the, the, the inner circles, Himmler and Bormann, that it might, that actually might, morale might be the problem, but um, even on, a, on a, a big of a larger scale, because many people did get in touch with Hitler, um, this became a problem because the reality of Hitler was very different from um, the propaganda of the so-called leader. Um, so there's, there's a lot of reports of people when they for the first time actually saw Hitler that they were completely shocked uh, of how devastatingly uh, deteriorated his health was. Um, so Hitler was more and more kept away uh, from, from others, uh, or kept himself away. He was hardly ever leaving the bunker anymore, um, staying even more in uh, a world of make-believe, and this created more and more uh, problems and eventually led to the uh, defeat. Okay, uh, now I move. Any questions from the audience, please? Yes. Oh, uh, hello, sir. Um, I actually, I read in one article that um, Hitler's mother was treated by a, uh, by a Jewish doctor and she died at that time and Hitler developed hatred towards all the Jews. This is an article I read about it. And also, uh, I read about your review, I think. So when he was taking so much of uh, medicine, it's not medicine, he has become a drug addict. You know, I don't take medicine every day for 450 days. So he's a wreck. Yeah. He's, he's, he's not even mentally fit, medically fit, you know. And how did the people of Germany accepted him as a leader? Even when he gave speeches, it was very, very aggressive, 
you know only the the people uh, who were with him was the, the military maybe not the public so israel did nothing to him isn't it yeah okay okay only okay because okay. of jesus uh, the, the doctor was jewish so he started developing hatred towards jewish people and this well, is a also... very personal thing and and became very very big and he started destroying the whole human kind The health of Hitler really deteriorated in 1944 after the bomb attack by Stauffenberg. After that, uh, he becomes dependent on a lot of drugs. And also after the bomb attack by Stauffenberg, no public photos of Hitler are allowed to be shown uh, to, to the population. So these speeches, they actually stop um, because the propaganda, the, 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 the apparatus doesn't want uh, anyone to, to see how bad he looks. That's why actually that's, this is one of the last photos of Hitler that uh, the publisher put on the cover here. This was taken on July 20th, 1944, and you can already see how deranged uh, he looks. Um, so this is very different from the image that the German population had of him. Uh, sir, uh, your argument is that uh, Hitler used the drugs for mind control and propaganda. But there must have been some other diseases, uh, terminally ill diseases like cancer, heart attack and all that. Was it there something like that during that particular time? And maybe he combined it. I think basically Hitler would have used drugs mainly to control the mind and propaganda purposes. But also he would have, there might have been some other diseases like the uh, complicated diseases like cancer or something like that would be there. That is one. And second question is, uh, 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 the uh, what do you think about, since you are talking about drugs, one question, first question. just volume on me. Uh, since you are talking about drugs, uh, the uh, legalization of marijuana. Marijuana is a dangerous one. It has been legalized in US. So I think, uh, do we need that kind of a development and all that? So I think that's a thing. Thank you. Yes, I think we need the legalization of marijuana because we have to understand that um, Marijuana is less harmful than alcohol, at least that's what uh, scientific um, research has shown so far. Um, and it's, it's very dangerous if governments, away from the scientific facts, on moral basis, try to uh, impose on people which drugs they should take and which drugs they shouldn't take. And actually the German government, which was trying to form a coalition between the Green Party, the Liberal Party and the Conservative Party, was very close to legalizing marijuana. And then the government, uh, the negotiations failed and now they're negotiating again. Uh, what kind of impact do you think this will have on uh, revisiting German history from now on? Do you think, has any German historians have personally approached and say, ah, now it makes sense, this is why, because it's so, so crazy. So uh, what kind of impact, long, you know, last, lasting impact will it have on, you know, you know thinking of how act crazy Third Reich, uh, the idea of Third Reich was actually used? Well, I think that it gives a more accurate picture of what was going on. Uh, I don't think it really changes the overall evaluation of what, what was going on, um, and it shouldn't change that. I think the views are very clear on, um, on, on what was happening. Um, it does deconstruct some of the myths that have still survived until today, myths that were created by the propag very powerful propaganda uh, system of, of National Socialism, the myth of the um, super strong German soldier, for example. Um, it just uh, gets uh, uh, deconstructed quite intensely if you read uh, how influential uh, stimulant drugs actually were for these early successes. And um, it also deconstructs some of the myths of uh, Hitler as this, uh, still seen by quite a few people around the globe, this powerful, pure, Uh, being that was working so hard for his people, uh, uh, the, the, the reality was actually, is actually uh, quite different and, 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 and gives a more, uh, 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 well, gives a more precise uh, view on, on his personality. Um, I found what you had to say about super soldiers, uh, the 35 million doses and 8 million soldiers, people staying up for 17 days, 17 nights, 
Um, is there other precedent in history where this has happened, or more specifically, was there a temptation by the by the allies who you said had been keeping track of what Nazi Germany was up to? Was there a temptation to use these things there, and was it I don't know human rights, or was it lack of access to the same? Well, I mean, the phenomenon in this in this first campaign, Germany against the West, was in a way that Germany was already fighting the Second World War while the British and the French were trying to recreate the First World War and were fighting with old-fashioned strategies and an old-fashioned mindset and also old-fashioned drugs like red wine. And so the Germans kind of were already on a different, different level. Um, and the, but the Allies quickly adapted to that. They learned very fast from what was going on. I mean, it took them obviously some time and that's what led to their first huge defeat uh, in the spring of 1940. But the, uh, the Royal Air Force, for example, the British Air Force quickly um, learned about the methamphetamine because the German pilots were also using that so they could f be longer in the air and more focused. So uh, there was a program uh, immediately put in, not immediately, but after a couple of months, a couple of crucial months, of course, but put into place by the Royal Air Force to look, should we also use methamphetamine or should we use amphetamines? And then they decided that they should use amphetamine. So 42, 43, the British Army kind of also uh, has drugs available. And then the Americans coming into the war, learning it from the British. So in a way, the Germans started a new uh, wave of uh, intoxicating soldiers. And this goes on to the present day. Um, I had a reading in San Francisco, and one of the listeners in the audience was um, a soldier for the U.S. Navy SEALs, which is the elite force of the, of, of the U.S., and he approached me after the reading saying that all these drugs that the Nazis were giving their soldiers are now you know, also used by the Navy SEALs. So this is, you, can, you can kind of trace a whole development of modern warfare that starts uh, in the spring of 1940 with this German attack on the West. See, I will ask the last question uh, because we have to wrap up for the next session. You had also documented the idea of using these prisoners as uh, for the clinical trials, uh, the gypsies and the Jews or the prisoners who have been used. Uh, what is the documentation of using of prisoners for the clinical trials and what is its impact even now? Well, this opens up a whole new uh, uh, theme, actually, and it's, it's the theme of how to develop uh, uh, very contemporary methods of uh, controlling people and uh, interrogation methods. And the Nazis were, again, the first ones to work on this, um, giving uh, psychoactive drugs like mescaline to um, concentration camp inmates in Dachau and then trying to figure out how they can manipulate uh, these people who have been given drugs without their knowledge. Um, so um, this is quite well documented, actually, and is, is part, of the, part of the book. Yeah. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you. Thank you.